Our scripture text this morning is found in Luke's gospel, the seventh chapter, beginning in the 36th verse. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw it, when the Pharisee saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you speak the pharisee replied a certain creditor had two debtors who owed 500 one owed 500 denarii and the other 50 and when they couldn't pay he canceled the debts for both of them now which of them do you think loved him more simon answered i suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt and jesus said to him you've judged rightly Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this then who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. This is a story from Luke about Jesus' openness to all people. Among the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is known as the Gospel of the poor and the marginalized. He shows a lot of concern for women who were easily the most marginalized group in that first century. And he shows compassion for all who lived on the bottom rung of the society of that day. Jesus is criticized in the Gospels for eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Gunter Bornkamm, the great German New Testament scholar, wrote a beautiful little book called Jesus of Nazareth. And he says in there that the main reason, when all is said and done from a historical perspective, the main reason that Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders of his day and ultimately was crucified was simply this, he hung around with the wrong kind of people. I'm indebted to this, uh, in in this sermon, to Michael Card. Michael Card is a uh, nationally known Christian musician, uh, wrote Amy Grant's uh, Emmanuel and El Shaddai. He's won uh, dozens and dozens of music awards. He lives in Franklin, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, where he does work toward racial reconciliation Uh, lives there with his family, but Michael Card along the way picked up a master's degree uh, in biblical studies, and he's written some wonderful little books on the Gospels. In fact, in the month that I took off before I came over here this summer, I read all four of his Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, books on the Gospels, and I am indebted in this sermon to him. Michael Card, being an artist and a biblical scholar, enters into scripture at the level of imagination and amazement. For him, imagination is what connects the mind to the heart, and Luke's a great book for him. We read in the gospel, Jesus' father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him, and everyone was amazed at all the things that Jesus was doing. And then we read, Peter went home amazed at what had happened. In today's text, Jesus has been invited by one of the Pharisees to come to his home for a meal. I mentioned that one of the accusations against Jesus was that he ate and drank with sinners. He certainly 
does a lot of things at meals in Luke's gospel. It seems in that gospel that he's either going to a meal, is at a meal, or is coming from a meal in most of the key scenes. At a banquet like this one, the guests would have been reclining on pillows, supported by their left arms, eating with their right hands, their feet away from the mat on which the food would be spread out before them. Although Simon the Pharisee had invited Jesus to his home, he apparently neglected the common courtesy of offering water and a towel so Jesus could wash his dusty feet. He also left out the customary kiss of greeting, maybe because he was a little suspicious of just whose side this Jesus might be on. And finally, he failed to provide Jesus with any refreshing oil to anoint his head. Small flask of alabaster and gypsum, gypsum were quarried along the Jordan River, or they could be imported from Egypt, were often available as perfumes. Now, just so you no, uh, if I ever come over to your house for dinner, we're going to waive most of these requirements. <laughs> but I wanted to set the scene here so you get some sense of what that meal was like. At some point during the meal, we're told that a sinful woman, a sinful woman, a woman of the streets makes her way directly behind where Jesus is reclining. You know, an occasion like that would have been more open than your home or my home because homes were open to the street, so the presence of uninvited guests would not have been that unusual. This woman may have heard Jesus speak, or she could have been one who had received John's baptism of repentance. Luke doesn't really care about that. He presents her as someone immediately caught up in the power of conviction. She begins to cry, and her tears actually fall on Jesus' unwashed feet. When she realizes what she's done, she kneels down and in a somewhat surprising gesture of intimacy, takes down her hair and wipes the tears off his feet. And after wiping her tears away, she pours a bottle of expensive perfume on Jesus' now clean feet. At this point, we're given a glimpse into Simon the Pharisee's thinking. He quickly makes two assumptions that imply two further inferences. One, he assumes the woman is a sinner. And secondly, he assumes that if Jesus were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she is. He then draws two false inferences. If Jesus knows what kind of woman is touching him, he wouldn't let her do it. And secondly, if Jesus does nothing to stop her, then he cannot possibly be a prophet. As you and I read the story, we can delight a little because we all already know enough from Luke's gospel at that point to know that Jesus is more than a prophet. That he knows not only who is touching him, he probably even knows what Simon is thinking. Simon is missing the point here. This happens a lot in Luke. Someone who should know, should know better just doesn't get it. And the last person on earth who should understand gets it fully. In this case, this humble woman knows her sin. She knows her need for Jesus. There is a paradox here for the outwardly religious. I think I've mentioned it here before. The church uh, uh, historian Van Harvey said one time that when he thought about evangelism, he didn't get a picture in his mind of people going out from the church to try to bring other people in. He had a picture of people crawling in through the church windows at, at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning to try to convert those of us in the pews. This woman sees the darkness in her own life. She believes Jesus is the person who can give her forgiveness and restoration. And because of the clarity of her spiritual vision, Jesus forgives her sins, but he doesn't simply dismiss Simon. Simon may be blind to the truth about his own life, but to dismiss him would make Jesus guilty of the same offense that Simon is guilty of. Jesus overlooks Simon's judgment of him and gently says, Simon, I have something to say to you. The Pharisee says, well, say it. So Jesus tells Simon a wonderful little story. A banker had two clients. One of them owed him $5,000 and the other owed him $50. They couldn't make their payments, but the banker canceled both loans. And Jesus says, so which one loved him more? Simon says, it had to be the one 
who owed the most money. And Jesus says, you're correct. And at that point, Simon is caught in what I would call the parable trap. Leander Keck, who taught New Testament at Vanderbilt and at Yale, said one time that good parables are like good jokes. Some people get them and some people don't. This is the greatest strength, the greatest weakness of Jesus' parables. If you do not engage, you're not going to get it. The parables demand interaction, but by their very nature, the parables reveal the character of the person who listens or doesn't listen to what is being said. Well, Simon's no fool, and so he begins to see. But then Jesus asks a question that gets to the real heart of the gospel story and to my sermon today. Jesus says to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? And that's a big question. Jesus is inviting Simon and Jesus is inviting you and me to engage. He wants us to see those around us not as a category, not as a sinner or someone who might be wrong, but simply as a person, a fellow human being, someone who needs to be loved and quite possibly forgiven. The beauty of these parables is that you and I get to put ourselves into the story. You know, we sometimes cast ourselves in the wrong part when we get a chance to put ourselves into a parable. I know every time I hear or read the Good Samaritan, I like to play either the Good Samaritan or the poor guy who got robbed. I very rarely see myself as a priest or a Levite who simply skirted by on the other side of the road. I spent a week in Amsterdam when I was in seminary, and one of the highlights of that was to go to the Rijksmuseum uh, there with, that has the all, almost all of the Rembrandt paintings. They're, they're larger than life, and, and they're so real. These characters look like they're going to just walk off the canvas and talk to you. There's one painting by Rembrandt that uh, has always uh, captured my attention. It portrays the final moments before Jesus Jesus' cross is raised. It's called the erection of the cross, and we see the soldiers and all the others who were there. There's something really striking, though, about the painting. Bathed in shadows, the only beam of light is focused on Jesus and his face, anticipating the pain that is to come. The only other principal person in the painting doesn't belong there. His clothes don't match the era. In fact, he's wearing an artist's beret on his head. His hands, though not visible, are helping to raise the cross. Those who knew Rembrandt recognized the man in the painting, the man with the green beret. It was Rembrandt himself. He painted himself into that famous painting, made himself one of the actors. It's a powerful crucifixion painting, but it's also Rembrandt's contrite confession of his own role, his own complicity in the crucifixion. It becomes a parable, a parable for you and me. Where are we in that crucifixion? People get crucified every day all around us. And sometimes you and I just stand by and watch. Or maybe we play a role. Jesus asked the question of the Pharisees. He says, do you see this woman? The minister, Robert Raines, uh, started an important church in Columbus, Ohio some years ago, told, uh, told the story of a fellowship group that would meet uh, at his church in the evenings where in inmates of a local prison would come and, and share time with church members. At the last meeting of the group, one of the men stood up with a sign he had made, and it said simply this. It said, for many years now, I have seen myself as a convict. Tonight... I see myself as a human being. Thank you. Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman? What would it be like for us to engage other people just as fellow human beings? We pigeonhole people. We say he's like that or she's like this. We impale them on the bulletin board of our imagination. We decide many times who they are before we ever talk to them. 
in the 1950s, a play that appeared on Broadway. Uh, they later uh, made it into a movie with Burt Lancaster and Katherine Hepburn, The Rainmaker by N. Richard Nash. In that play, Lizzie, the daughter, tells a friend about her dad. She says, some nights I'm in the kitchen washing the dishes and Pop's playing poker with the boys, and I watch him real close. And at first, I just see an ordinary middle-aged man, not very interesting to look at. And then minute by minute, I see the little things I never saw before. Good things and bad things, odd little habits I never noticed he had, and the, a way of that he talks that I never paid any mind to. And suddenly, I know who he is. And I love him, I love him so much I could cry. It makes me want to thank God that I took time to see him real. You and I can choose to see people real. Jesus' little parable in our text today is just two verses long, but it speaks volumes. There's a role for the woman as the great debtor, and for the Pharisee, Simon is the one who owed less. Jesus is inviting you and me to take our place in the parable. You and I get to find our place at Simon's banquet. Will we sit beside Jesus and acknowledge only a small debt, or will we fall down at his feet and beg for forgiveness we do not deserve? I did an internship out of seminary at United Methodist uh, Church of the Servant in Oklahoma City, and when I finished a 12-month internship there, I, I did by choice, uh, chose to work manpower labor division that summer in Oklahoma City before going back to seminary to finish my degree. You met up downtown at 6 o'clock in the morning. It was just me and the homeless to semi-homeless people who were looking for a day's work for less than minimum wage. And they gave me some rough assignments. I cleaned food trays at the hospital. I swept out warehouses in intense heat. I dug, helped dig sprinkler systems in that hard Oklahoma clay in 104 degree uh, weather. But more than anything, I had the experience of not being treated as a human being. When we went to lunch, because I was a manpower guy, I had to ride on the back of the truck. I couldn't ride in the cab with the other workers. And when we got to Burger King, uh, I had to sit at another table. They didn't let me sit and eat with them. I know now how that feels, and I hope I never treat another person like that. I tell you what, it made me want to go back to SMU and, and uh, get this robe so I could, uh, could be up here with you today. In our text from Luke today, Simon listens to Jesus. He hears the story of his own life. It would be nice to say that love leads to forgiveness, but in the end, we see that the woman had the ability to love because she was forgiven. We have to somehow, you and I, get this from head to heart. The fourth step in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is made a ser searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. It takes searching and honesty and humility to find our place at Simon's banquet. As you meet people in the days to come, I hope you will at least hear Jesus' question, do you see this woman, do you see this man? We need to see each other real. We need to take what's in our head and move it to our heart. Jesus was certainly more than a prophet. His ability to forgive the humble and the sinful, that was what was revealed to people then and to the rest of us now, that he did indeed share the heart and character of God. And the heart of God, you see it over and over and over again in, in the Gospels. Michael Cards helped me with that as well. It's Hesed. It's mercy. Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. Uh, God says, I don't need sacrifice. I want mercy. Uh, and you see it that uh, not only does Jesus see mercy as the heart of God, he sees it as his own heart. The behavior of the woman in our story is that of a person who's been forgiven. The New English Bible translates verse 47, And so I tell you, her great love proves that her many sins have been forgiven. Her love didn't earn her forgiveness. To the contrary, because she was forgiven much, she loved much. This 
story that I read to you ends with a, with a Christological argument about Jesus' uh, identity, his, his authority to forgive sins. Jesus' final words to the wo woman, though, raise an interesting question and, and a challenging question. He says to her, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So where does a woman like this go when Jesus tells her to go in peace? The price of this woman's life, her difficulties, her decisions, that period of being lost has totally removed her from the respectable institutions of her day that could maybe have helped a single woman. The only place where she's welcomed is in the street among people like herself. What she needs is a community of forgiven and forgiving sinners people like you and me. The story cries out, this story cries out for church, not just any church. This story cries out for a church that says, you are welcome here. Will you pray with me? Help us, O merciful God, to love as we have been loved. Help us to really see the men and women we encounter. Help us to see your image in your children. Help us to be the church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.